Hey guys, welcome to the Mixing Martial Arts Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Wagner, and we have a hell of a UFC event to go over tonight. Nah, I'm kidding. The main event was great, but aside from that, the card was pretty shit. But what else would you expect when Sean Strickland's in the co-main event? But before I talk shit about that, I'm going to gush over Islam Mahajev and Dustin Poirier a little bit. I honestly expected this fight to be a, a gimme fight for Islam. I didn't really see Poirier having much at all for him. I thought he'd finish it within probably three rounds or so. But I was impressed with Poirier. He fought a really good fight. Um, he overperformed my expectations for sure. And I also think Islam's wrestling underperformed. But we saw some clear striking improvements from Mahachev. Uh, and with the fight being more competitive than expected, it gave him a, a chance to show off his brilliance in transitions, which is always really lovely to watch, probably my favorite part of his game. His counterpunching looked greatly improved, his right hook was a lot tighter than it has been before. Uh, it's basically what Islam, his game plan for this fight, he was setting up outside Poye's range just to step beyond jabbing range, uh, and he was trying to force Poye to step onto him. Poye had to worry about being too aggressive and giving up his hips for Islam's reactive takedowns, and that kind of forced him into a predictable pattern of offense. He couldn't just rapidly cover distance or get too comfortable, like double jabbing in to spring into his left hand, because there was the ever-present threat of Mahajev ducking in on his hips and getting a takedown, which would likely spell the end of the round for Poye, where on Islam's part, he was covering distance pretty well when he went on the lead. Uh, he had a nice double jab at times, and he was jabbing with Poye to back him off. Uh, there were a few times he chased Poye's exit out of the pocket too, and he had a lot more freedom to open up in those spots than Poye because he didn't have to worry about the wrestling, obviously. Uh, so Dustin was kind of left mostly attacking with lunging jabs for the first two or three rounds, and Islam did a really great job timing those with counters. He hit a lot of nice counters off the inside slip. He would slip inside the jab and rip the body with a right hook. Um, there were a couple times where he used a, a nice uppercut hook combination where he'd slip inside the jab, uh, pop Poye with a lead uppercut and turn the arm over right into a lead hook uh, to move around Poye's guard and kind of confuse his defense. Islam was also doing quite a good job moving around at range and commanding the octagon. Um, one thing I liked was that he wasn't too he wasn't over eager to bite on the counters. A lot of times he would watch the lunging jab and just back away from it uh, or very slightly move his head and it prevented Poye from being able to do much to draw out his counters. A lot of times Poye would kind of hop in behind a throwaway jab and duck down, almost as if expecting Islam to throw something back at him. Uh, but instead of biting on it, Islam would often just back up. So Poye had a, had a hard time like drawing out his counters and timing them with counters of his own. Islam was pivoting quite well off his jab when Poye tried to corner him. Uh, he also did a really good job when Poye would double jab in. He'd anticipate the, the left hand and weave under it, uh, and then he'd circle out and get off the cage. For Poye on the feet, I think the, the biggest missed opportunity for him, something that if you're in his camp, you'd probably want to see him have a lot more success with, uh, was on the counter. In the later rounds, especially four and five, uh, once Islam's wrestling hadn't been working quite as well, uh, and Poye felt a little bit more comfortable advancing, Islam had to open up on the lead a lot more, uh, rather than sitting back and waiting for Poye to lead so he could counter. And he was exposing himself more than he usually does, but Poye wasn't able to do much there. He would often back himself out of range or shell up and let the opportunity to counter pass by. And with Mahachev, he's difficult to hit with pot shots from range or short combinations when you're trying to follow him backwards, because he has pretty solid first stage defense. He slips well on the initial entry, uh, but if you can get him in exchanges or get him leading and crack him while he's punching, he's a lot less defensively responsible uh, and his reactions aren't nearly as good as the exchange goes deeper as they are when you first enter to punch with him. Of course, opening up more on the counter would also expose Poye's hips to takedowns. Islam could like jab in, get him swinging back and then duck in on his hips, but Islam's never been the best about setting up his takedowns proactively with strikes anyway. The best part of the fight for Poye was definitely his dirty boxing. He did some really good work uh, countering Islam's collar ties with uppercuts. He did a really good job framing off when Islam was trying to enter the clinch. Islam would reach for the collar tie, uh, and Poye would lay his forearm across the face to frame out, or he'd be ready to pummel inside with his own collar tie. And there was that one time in, I think, the third round, where Islam was trying to control him with the collar ties, and Poye landed a, a really nice sequence where he teed off in the body. A lot of Islam's best offense came in those transitional exchanges off collar ties too, though. He would throw out a punch and get Poye slipping off line or holding up a high guard and then step into the double collar tie with a knee. He did a real good job entering the clinch off Poye's punches too. Like he would slip inside a left hand, 
uh, and catch an underhook and then work into a collar tie and start kneeing him. There was this one really lovely sequence from Islam where he caught Poye with an uppercut ducking onto it and then he transitioned right into a double collar tie and threatened knees. And when Poye kind of opened his elbows looking to pummel in and address the collar tie, Islam went right into a body lock, drove him back to the fence and took him down. One thing about how Islam uses his collar ties, he's really great about using it to hit and transition on the initial entry or to quickly transition into like a body body lock or an overhook where he can hit his takedowns, but he's not super advanced with the like positional understanding of striking off the collar ties. There were quite a few times where he left a lot of space for Poye to uppercut or hook around, uh, and he wasn't too great about directing Poye's balance, like using the, the control of the head to off-balance him. If you watch Demetrius Johnson, he's constantly turning you and off-balancing you uh, with your head when he has the, the, those collar ties, so it's hard to for the opponents to set their weight for counters. We could see this on the cage too. At one point, Islam's back was against the cage and he tried to work in the double collar tie, but Poye was able to kind of push forward and like smother it. When DJ gets his elbows in along the cage, he's instantly turning off the cage, like ripping your head past and then turning onto the turning so your back is to the cage with knees and elbows. There was one point where Mahachev reached for the double collar tie and Poye threw his hips in really hard. Um, so that he could keep his posture up straight and avoid knees, but he was hipping in so hard that he was almost leaning back, and Mahachev kept trying to hold onto the head and ended up like almost kind of leaving his own feet and getting thrown off, where that would have been a great chance to feed Poye an elbow or like go with his own momentum and just trip his leg out backwards while he's leaning back. One other thing I really loved about Islam's work on the feet, um, in the later rounds, in rounds four and five, when Poye started coming on a bit stronger, he did a really good job of closing distance to to defend the punches rather than continually backing up. If you're always backing up, it's easier for guys to predict where you're going to be and easier to like to track you with proactive combinations where Poe would step in for a combination and Islam would like just duck his head into the chest um, and he wasn't taking himself out of position while he was doing it. He wasn't like folding too far over his hips or looking at the ground or anything. He would just close distance to meet Poe's aggression and it would kind of throw off Poye's distance and timing a little bit. And then once he'd got his bearings back and was ready to punch with Mahachev, it put Mahachev in a better position to land strong counters. He landed some, some really nice right hooks off that. Mahachev's willingness to step into Poye when he was moving backwards also let him do some more work threatening the clinch entries and punching off of it. He would kind of go to duck into Poye's chest, and Poye would extend his hand uh, like he's framing across the face, uh, thinking Islam's about to enter the clinch, and then Islam would hit him for free. As for the wrestling, Mahachev struggled with his open space shots. Poe did a really good job of pushing the head down and limp lagging, uh, and Mahachev was largely taking pretty poor shots from too far away. Part of that was that Poe was being cautious um, with how, how he was advancing. He was specifically trying not to give up his hips, uh, but Mahachev also isn't great at proactively striking into his takedowns, so he would end up shooting from a bit too far away and putting himself in poor position on the initial shot. And when you're shooting from range like that, you want your initial shot to bump the guy off balance. You want to get in on their hips with your back straight and your legs and hips underneath you so that as you penetrate, they're kind of thrown backwards and you can keep the momentum up and run through them. Uh, with Mahajev, you could see when he first made contact with Poye, Poye wasn't really moved at all. Uh, so he could immediately, he had a lot of time to see the entry and then he could go right into his uh, push the head inside and limp leg out sequence without first having to catch his balance and being put a step behind on the, the defensive wrestling. Mahachev's wrestling on the cage was a lot better, though. Early in the first round, he hit that trademark, a.k.a. single leg lift. That was one of the, the Khabib specialties, where he locks up a high single leg right in the crotch with kind of upright posture, and then steps his near leg deep between your legs so that he can lift and apply all that force directly to your center of gravity. And then as you go up, he just trips the standing leg out. It's a classic, one of the higher percentage takedowns you can hit against the cage, and it's a really great chain wrestling option too, because often the defensive wrestler will be prioritizing the double leg, they'll be looking to down block or control a wrist and make sure you can't lock hands around both their legs, and what Habib would often do, he would kind of, he would go for the double and they would hand fight off, uh, control a hand so he's not able to lock around both their legs, and you, you think you're kind of safe from there, but he would just let you take his wrist off and then lock it around the single, 
And even if you had an underhook or a wizard and were trying to pull his arm up, it didn't matter. He would just lift right through that and trip your leg out. As long as he could lock two hands around that leg and get his posture up and his head inside, you were going down. Although he struggled to wrestle in open space for most of the fight, the, the sequence that started off the finish was some really lovely chain wrestling from Islam. He got in on a single leg and tried to do a cutback, where he drops down towards the caught leg um, and uses, looks to use the momentum to ground Poye and expose his far hip. And Poye did a really good job of posting out, posting his hand on the mat to stop himself from going over, and then switching his hips so he wouldn't, so Islam couldn't get to his far hip. Uh, but as Islam came back up on the leg, Poye kind of got a little bit lazy and just had his left arm monitoring like the head and shoulder, where it should have been forcing Islam's head back inside so he could go back to that limp leg that had been working for him all fight. Islam ended up standing up with the leg trapped, but his grip really low near the ankle where it's hard to hit a, a high crotch from, but he adjusted beautifully and like pulled the leg uh, outwards and back and then just kind of swooshed Poye onto the floor. It's a finish you'll see now and again to the single leg in wrestling, um, but most often I see it in Sanda. They call it a whirl throw. It's really useful for countering kicks. If you watch a lot of Sanda, you'll see them like grab front kicks or side kicks and then do that throw where they like pull the leg outwards and down and just swing the guy down to the mat. It's a really great counter for kicks, especially um, because it works by like pulling your weight forward onto the leg and then taking it out from underneath you. And when they're kicking, their weight is already coming a little bit forward off the leg. So you can really smoothly transition from catching the kick right into that little leg whip. That sent Poye onto all fours and Mahachev immediately pounced on the front headlock and locked up a Dars. What I really liked from Islam on the Dars uh, is that he didn't try to reach through to the neck immediately and give Poye a chance to, to build up his posture and escape. Instead, he broke him down with a pinch headlock. He, like, pinched his head and arm together and sat him down to a hip. So Poye was underneath Mahachev in a worse position, trying to come up on the underhook, and that's when Mahachev reached through to lock up the choke. And as he was, as he was sliding his forearm through uh, and cinching it up with the other arm, he took his non-choking forearm uh, and laid it across the back of Dustin's head to really crunch his head in, and then he sat down to a hip himself and crunched Dustin's head right into his chest. So as he was hipping in and squeezing to finish the choke, Poye's head and neck was being crunched right into that choking grip. Mahachev also did some really nice work on top when he got Poye down earlier in the fight. Um, he had that lovely back take off the Kimura, where he looked for the Kimura from half guard and Dustin tried to turn away from it, and then Mahachev used that to take his back and lock up the body triangle. Once he got on his back with the body triangle, uh, he was trying to, he was like threatening to come on top of Poye to get him to post out his hands and then take his neck. That's a really good way to open up the neck for a choke because nobody wants to be in belly down back control, especially in MMA where you can punch and that position often equals a finish. So when you threaten it, they'll they'll post their arm out to avoid going over and then it like takes their shoulder away from their throat and they can't hand fight for a moment and you can snatch up the neck. Damian Maya likes this. If you watch his fight with Nate Quarry, that's how he finished Quarry. Uh, he had a body triangle and with his instep kind of pressuring the back of the thigh, and he was trying to force Corey over, uh, and Corey was rolling around to to avoid getting forced onto all fours. And then at one point, Maya kind of hipped into him like he was about to force him into belly down back control. Corey posts his hand out, and Maya takes the neck while his hand's occupied. Poye also did a really good job getting back to his feet when he was taken down, I think, the third round, um, where Majev got on his back and then went to mount. Poye, I think, posted his feet on the cage and bridged Mahajev over and Mahajev switched to an armbar, and Poye was able to get out of it. Really great fight all around from both guys. Um, like I said, I was impressed with Poye, and I didn't ex expect him to, to do that well. Mahajev looked amazing in transitions. Um, he showed off some really improved striking. I was really impressed with his counterpunching. For Mahajev, the next move looks like it's going to be Armin Sarukian after his win over Charles Oliveira. I imagine there'll be some amazing scrambles in that fight, just like their first one. Sarukian's a fantastic defensive wrestler, and has amazing scrambling, but I have trouble seeing him beating Islam because the striking disparity has just gotten larger since their first fight. Islam's improved a lot on the feet, where Sarukian I don't think has nearly as much. As for Poye, I know he's been talking about retirement lately, and it seems like this is the perfect time for it. He's not getting another title shot at this point, and even though he didn't beat Mahachev, he would still be leaving the sport on a high on an impressive performance against an all-time great opponent where he pretty thoroughly eclipsed anyone's expectations of him. Alright, now I guess I gotta talk about the middleweights. This was an ugly ass fight, man. After a couple minutes, I looked down at the time, 
and got jump scared by the five round marker. I don't know why they decided to make this one take 25 minutes. Costa landed some hard leg kicks for the first few minutes, but once Strickland started his trailer park Moy Cow March, he had like no idea how to react. The story of this fight for me was Costa not having any real idea how to attack Strickland's awkward marching, and Strickland managing to get off little enough offense that it still ended up close. Costa ended up mostly just kind of running away and trying to pot shot from the outside, circling out in wide arcs, and Strickland still couldn't cut off the cage. So it ended up being a messy fight where Strickland would just follow him around flicking out little jabs and front kicks while Costa circled like the perimeter of the fence, occasionally lunging in with a jab or left hook that would hit forearm and then going back to doing his circling at range. Lateral movement can be a, a good way of dealing with that kind of marching style, but you want to do like tight pivots where you're cutting angles rather than uh, circling out in a sweeping arc because they can just follow you. Costa kind of caught on to this late in the fight in rounds four and five. Um, he would pivot and jab down the center or throw a body jab, and that worked a little bit. But if he'd been doing it from the start, uh, he could have taken himself out of the path of the teeps and made Strickland stop and reset when he was following him around. And I have no idea why Costa was so hesitant to throw punches in combination. This was the whole thing with the Adesanya fight, where he would throw out one or two punches, Strickland would just stick his forearms up and they'd bounce off, and then Adesanya would go right back to kicking into Strickland's checks and backing himself up to the fence. But that's just kind of who Adesanya is. He's never comfortable punching in combination. But Costa just kind of fell into the same trap. One of the reasons I find Strickland so irritating to watch is that his awkward style just seems to like break guys' brains, especially because it's middleweight and he's not fighting like the craftiest or most skilled strikers anyway. But that awkward little drummer boy ass march just turns guys into like weird outside pot shotters who don't really know how to make that style work. Especially because Strickland's punching defense is really well set up to deal with the first couple shots, but falters the deeper into combinations you get. Um, like he'll, whenever guys come in with the lead hand, they try to jab or left hook him. He'll raise his rear forearm across his face and flick out a little jab and let you run into it. Uh, and when you throw the right hand, he just pulls his head back. So if you're skipping around at range and trying to come in with one-off shots, then you're not going to catch him. But if you throw in combination, you can move his, his rear forearm around, uh, like Para, a lead uppercut and a lead hook, or like Pereira did, the, the body jab, get him reaching down for it and go back upstairs with the hook. Those long right hands from range aren't going to catch him because he's able to pull his head back when they're coming. But if you step in deep with like a, a jab and left hook and keep your feet underneath you so you can get off the straight, then when he goes to pull his head back, you'll be close enough that you might land. It opens up the leg kicks Costa was looking for too. If you're just trying to kick at him while his leg is elevated, it'll bounce right off his shin. But if you work inside and throw a left hook and then hammer the leg, the left hook all forces weight onto the leg so he can't lift it up to check and make the leg kick a lot easier to land. After the fight, I heard some people on Twitter talking about how the commentators always pump up Strickland's cardio, like how he's marching the other guy down and wearing them out, and he's going to come on really strong in the championship rounds. And then in rounds four and five, he gets slower and barely does anything. And I don't know if that's like a usual trend, because I'm honestly never able to sustain my attention for 25 minutes of a Sean Strickland fight, with the sole exception of the Adesanya fight, just because that was so so surprising and interesting that it was happening to Adesanya, even if a lot of long stretches of the fight were kind of boring. But aside from that, my my interest and my attention is waning pretty quick by then. But yeah, in the later rounds of this fight, Strickland kind of took his foot off the gas and didn't really do much. Costa was getting back into it a little bit and started kind of figuring some things out, but it was kind of half-hearted and he was already tired by that point, so he couldn't really get too much going either. But yeah, there's a lot of ways to effectively attack that kind of marching style he's using, but the guys he's fighting are just not really equipped and don't seem to know how to go about it. Um, when you see you see that style a lot in Muay Thai, so if you watch Muay Thai, you'll see how guys deal with it. One thing a lot of them do is timing leg kicks as the, the lead leg touches down, and Strickland marches kind of in a, in a set rhythm, so it's kind of predictable. Costa did kind of try that a few times, uh, but since this, isn't, this style isn't really something he's seen before, he didn't have the timing on it very well. Uh, Strickland also did a, a good job of getting his rear leg in front of a few of those leg kicks too. But when he's marching forward like that and picking up his legs alternately, he spends a lot of time in a very square, narrow, and upright stance with one foot off the ground. And when you're standing like that, you're a mark for a big teep. There's kind of a thing sometimes where guys who are really good with a certain weapon don't like it when that weapon is used against them. You can often bother a heavy leg kicker by kicking them in the legs back. And 
the way Strickland operates makes him a mark for, for guys who are willing to teak with him, especially because he's following guys around with those short range flicky teeps from that square stance. Um, a really hard side teep to the gut would probably knock him on his ass with that stance. And the way Costa was standing in a really bladed and wide stance, if he'd been willing to just step in and throw a hard side teep to the gut, I bet he'd have knocked Strickland on his ass a few times. There were a couple times where Costa kicked him in the body and Strickland kind of like went flying backwards just because he was so narrow and upright. If he'd replaced the some of the body kicks and the silly spinning back kicks with a hard teep, I think that would have done a lot of good. If Costa is worried about moving forward in case he gets intercepted with a teep, he can also like faint forward steps to draw the teep out and then let it fall short and step in and punch as it retracts, especially with Strickland because those are like really short teeps. Uh, he doesn't have the stance to really extend his hip far. You can feint in and get him throwing it short and then take advantage of that. Another neat counter to that kind of style. This isn't something that I expect an MMA fighter to do, but if you watch Boonlong Pet Indy, you'll see him do this a lot. Uh, he's one of the, the hardest pound for pound kickers in Muay Thai. Uh, he shattered a couple guys' arms with his kicks in the first couple rounds just by kicking them in the arms. So his opponents are always trying to march him down to close off the open side and prevent him from landing that that hard kick on their arms. When he's backing up, he'll keep weight on the front foot while retreating, so he's always in position to fire off a kick and intercept them. Usually when you're moving, you want to move the, the foot closest to the direction you're moving in first, so you widen your stance a little bit and then narrow it up when your other foot follows. Otherwise, you can end up putting yourself out of position and kind of off balance, but he intentionally steps back with his front foot first so that when his back foot follows to put him back into his normal stance, his weight is still on his front foot, so he can kick immediately from the, the backward step. When he steps back and his opponents try to follow him, as soon as his rear foot touches down, he's immediately ready to spring off into a kick because his weight is kept on his front foot. He'll also take really long uh, back steps and cross steps, where he's stepping his lead leg back into the opposite stance or stepping it across his body to, to get a lot of distance all at once or take an angle and make the guy marching him down stop and turn on the spot. And then it's the same thing there. He'll end up moving his rear foot last, so his weight is kept on his front foot as he's taking that step. And if they try to follow him, he's immediately ready to spring into the round kick. He did that a lot in his fight against Chalam Dam last year. Anyways, I'm slipping into talking about Muay Thai because I don't want to talk about Sean Strickland anymore. So I'll just end this segment by uh, quoting friend of the show Luca Bourdon on Twitter after this fight. He said, Sean Strickland fights like some historical martial arts dude trying to recreate Muay Thai from three cave drawings and 2% of an oral tradition. That's the perfect description of Sean Strickland. That's about all I care about on the UFC card. Uh, Kevin Holland and Michal Oleksijuk had a fun fight that only lasted a minute or two, where Oleksijuk dropped him quickly and then Holland snatched up an armbar. Roman Kopilov is usually good fun, but his fight on this card kind of stunk, and there weren't really any interesting moments to write home about on the prelims. There was an ACA card over in Russia, uh, ACA 176. It wasn't one of their best cards, but there were a few fun fights on it. The main event was Ali Abdulhalikov versus Davi Hamosh. Abdulhalikov is a 14-2 Russian striker. Hamosh is an old UFC vet. He's like 37 at this point, and ACA just loves bringing in Brazilian jobbers for their Russians to beat up. This fight was a quarterfinal of ACA's lightweight Grand Prix. The winner of this goes on to face Abdulaziz Abdulvahabov. Abdulvahabov uh, is one of the like three kings of ACA's lightweight division with Edward Vartanian and Ali Bogov. Six years or so ago, these three were all top five to seven lightweights. ACA had an amazing lightweight division, and these guys were some of the best in the world, but they're quite a bit past their prime right now. Edward Vartanian is the only one of them who still looked uh, very good in his recent performances. Abdul Holikov beat the shit out of Hamosh, as expected, but it wasn't a super fun fight. Um, it was kind of a slow and methodical performance from Abdul Holikov. He's a crafty striker, but in a very Russian way, where he can't really box and doesn't have great ring craft, but he has some good strike mix-ups, and he's pretty smart about picking up on openings. Uh, he's usually kind of a karate-style outside kicker. He didn't kick much in this fight because of Hamosh's wrestling and grappling, uh, but he showed off a few smart tactics on the outside. He landed some cool counter knees with his back to the cage. Hamosh would duck in for a takedown, and Abdul Holikov would anticipate that and like knee him in the chest. Uh, he also showed off some nice uh, striking off his lateral movement. When his back was nearing the cage, he'd open up his stance to sidestep uh, and start sidestepping along the cage, and then as Hamosh widened his stance to follow or stepped across himself, 
Abdul Holikov would quickly drop into a set stance and launch into a punching combination. He, he managed to cross Hamosh up a few times and surprise him with that, where Hamosh would step across himself and then be out of position to defend the punches. He also landed some crafty shifting punches, uh, switching up to southpaw. Uh, there was one point where he landed a nice front kick that pushed Hamosh back, and then he quickly did like a switch step on the spot, switched to southpaw with his lead leg outside Hamosh's, and kind of like blocked the lead leg so he almost tripped over it um, while crowding into Hamosh and landing a, a rear hook. There was some really crafty takedown defense from Abdul Holikov in this fight too. Hamosh is a really good grappler. Uh, he won ADCC a while ago in like 2006, I think, uh, with that crazy flying arm bar against Lucas Laprie, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but he got Abdul Holikov down in the first round and Ali did a good job framing off his face uh, to to recover his hips and scraping his back up the, the cage wall when Hamosh tried to sit on his legs. When Hamosh shot in after that, Ali would go to like a two-on-one control, that uh, thing you saw Leon Edwards do against Kamaru Usman, where Usman would shoot against the cage and Leon didn't have enough space to get his hips back, so instead he'd just down block with both hands to one arm and lift Usman's arm up and then use that to upgrade to an underhook and start working off the cage. And Abdul Holikov did that well here. He would go to the two-on-one, and then a lot of guys stay there, which isn't a good idea because they can chain wrestle off uh, and go to a single leg or work on powering through your grip and locking their hands together, and you don't really have a great way off the cage from there. But Abdul Holikov was smart about it uh, and just used it to lift the arm up and get to an underhook rather than hanging out there. So Abdul Holikov will be fighting Abdulaziz Abdul Holikov. Ah, I'm saying way too many Russian names way too fast. He'll be fighting Triple A next, and Triple A uh, was a truly excellent fighter in his prime, uh, especially in the clinch. He's got an amazing clinch game, but he's pretty old and past it now. Um, he's been looking rough in his recent performances, and he's always struggled with rangy fighters, with rangy strikers who don't have to step in on him and can extend the distance and pot shot. He has tiny little T-Rex arms, and he's not super great about closing distance with his feet underneath him. So I think Abdul Holikov will get him, give him a lot of trouble. On the other side of the bracket is Ali Bogov versus Hurtison Batista. Bogov, another one of those former ACA greats who's past their best now. Hurtison Batista, I think he fought Ali Bogov years ago. Um, he's a fun Brazilian banger who just upset Mehdi Dakayev, another pretty interesting prospect, uh, by smashing him with double collar tie knees. Bogov and Batista fight on June 28th on an upcoming ACA card, and then the winner of that will take on Abdul Holikov for the finals of the tournament. Another fight on that card worth talking about, uh, Josie El Silva versus Ahmed Musakayev. I'm a fan of both of these guys. Silva is a, a really fun striker who's been in ACA for a long time and has kind of slowly worked out how to deal with their wrestlers. Uh, Ahmed Musakayev is a crafty wrestler. He has some really slick upper body throws, um, but he's kind of rough on the feet. He's not a great athlete. Silva's kind of turned into a solid anti-wrestler after years of getting ground out by Russians. One of the keys to his improvements is he developed a lot of patience and learned like not to bite on every counter opportunity. Fighters in the Russian circuit are often not very good at boxing, but they tend to have very good wrestling and be solid in transitions. Um, so a lot of their wrestlers struggle to see opportunities in the pocket for like reactive takedowns, but they're really good at like blitzing in with a, a long reaching overhand. Uh, and anticipating your counter and ducking under that onto your hips. Silva would do that a lot in his earlier career, where he'd get like excited to counter, and then they'd just go right underneath him onto his hips and take him down. Um, he's learned to use his footwork and head movement to let those long reaching shots miss without giving up his hips. Um, rather than countering at every opportunity, he'll kind of park his weight out over his lead foot uh, to draw guys into swinging at him. And when they do, he'll just pull his head back slightly or slip outside of it, He'll often draw it out with like bouncing feints too. He did that really well against Musakayev. Uh, so he was able to force Musakayev to reach for him as his baits weren't really working. He would like throw those long reaching punches to duck in on the hips, but Silva would just step back slightly or move his head a little bit to make the punch miss without swinging back and taking his elbows away from his ribs. Uh, so when Musakayev shot in anticipating the counter, he still had his hands in position to down block or frame off he Lately, Silva's been keeping most of his heavily committed punches to the body, so he'll kind of pick guys off on the outside with his footwork, jab them up, and kick their legs. 
Uh, and then when he wants to do some damage, he'll step in with a couple hard body shots. And when wrestlers try to change levels, they can't get underneath the body shots the way they can with headshots. So he'll he'll end up keeping an underhook if they try to shoot through it. Silva even hit one of the kind of takedowns that Musakayev was going for all fight, where he stepped in with a jab, drew a counter right hand, and then ducked under it onto the hips. Musakayev showed off some pretty crafty work from the bottom. Uh, he was trying to chain shoulder crunches and like knee shields and that reverse butterfly hook. Um, eventually, he was along the cage and he switched his hips and got both arms on one side of the head like he was going for a wall walk. Uh, and that Josiel Silva kind of like elevated his hips and buried his head to, to crunch him down and control his posture. And Musakayev used that to throw in a guillotine. Uh, and then Silva tried to back his hips out, which gave Musakayev space to throw in a knee shield and elevate him with it. Uh, and at the same time, he was pummeling an underhook and came up to Silva's back. But most of the fight was Josiel Silva picking at Musakaya from range and beating up his body a little bit on the inside. The final ACA fight that was worth watching was uh, Goga Shamatava against Ali Mardin Abdikarov. This was a fun back and forth brawl. Not a huge one for technique and tactic nerds, but Abdikarov is a big muscly guy with a big left hook. And Shamatava is a, like a wide stance loopy unorthodox kind of guy. And they were throwing at a really high clip and messing each other up pretty badly. After the second round, Abdikarov's eye looked completely swollen shut from getting lit up with counters. There's no way that dude could see anything out of his eye, but the ref didn't seem to check at all. They slowed down a little bit in round three, but both of them were pretty tired and they'd fought at a high pace, so it's hard to blame them for that. There were a couple Muay Thai fights last week worth mentioning too. Uh, the best one was My Singkam Soar Ying Charon Farm versus Singdom Cafe Focus. I haven't watched too much of My Sinkom before. He's been fighting in one championship quite a bit lately, which I don't watch as much. He recently knocked out Chalamdam Nayak Athazala in Chalamdam's only one fight uh, in the first round with a body punch. This was an insane fight. My Sinkom started out hot and he didn't slow down at all. He came out super aggressive, uh, pressuring and flurrying with punch combinations early. Singdom Cafe Focus is an, a southpaw open side kicker who mostly works with his rear kick. My Singkom would feint entries and hop in behind his raised lead leg to draw out Singdom's open side kick, and then when it missed, he'd leap back in with huge punch flurries. Um, he would he kind of just ran into the kick. He wasn't like doing a lot of he'd cross check it a few times and like block it with his lead leg, but often he was just barreling himself right into the kick and trying to counter it by taking it on his arms and then smashing Singdom's body. And that can be an effective way to dissuade the kick, but in a Muay Thai fight, it's hard to win against top competition when you're leaving yourself so vulnerable to the kick. But his aggression paid off here. He was able to drop Singdom with one of the big punch flurries in the second round. And in Muay Thai, if somebody gets an early knockdown, that's often the deciding factor of the fight. Muay Thai is ostensibly scored round by round, but the judges consider what happened in the earlier rounds when scoring the current round. So if somebody gets a big knockdown early, then they're usually able to ride the rest of the fight out by just fighting defensively. So you'll often see a guy get an early knockdown and then just not push very hard to do more damage after that and just kind of defend uh, until a, he wins a decision. My Singkom was still super aggressive though, but Singdom also got aggressive back after he got dropped uh, because he needed to get the points back and like do something to hurt My Singdom or show dominance that he's still in the fight. Uh, and, and in round three, Singdom was started trying to kind of march into the clinch and land knees, and Mizingkom just destroyed him with counter elbows. The first knockdown in the third round, Singdom tried to march in on him, and he framed the face away and threw a couple clean elbows at him. And then Singdom got up, tried to march back at him, and Mizingkom flattened him with a huge overhand elbow. Mizingkom will definitely be a fun one to keep an eye on. I don't know how well his style will work out against top competition, or maybe he has like something in the tank to moderate himself. Maybe he's able to like uh, be a little bit more nuanced and conservative when he's dealing with somebody who has the skills to maintain distance and avoid getting flurried on while scoring with that their higher scoring open side kick. Because he was super content to just run right into Singdom's kick here. And I don't know how much of that is just because he's like a super reckless goofball and how much is because he just didn't respect Singdom and knew he could hurt him. But either way, if he starts fighting better competition, it'll be fun to watch him either like rise to the occasion and manage to finish them like that too, or get picked apart. The performance I most enjoyed from last week was Song Payak's fight against Captain Team Sit Thailand. Song Payak is the little brother of Pan Payak and Q Payak Jitwangnan. 
Pan Payak, uh was the best fighter of the last generation. He won, I think, three consecutive Fighter of the Year awards. He is one of the best and most accomplished fighters since Sanchai's generation. Um, Q Payak, his younger brother, was an elite fighter as well. I think he won one Roger Demnern title, but he was also uh, consistently a top pound-for-pound -pound fighter. Song Payak is their younger brother. He's 17 years old, and he's a burgeoning top 10 fighter at 115 pounds right now. Like his brothers, he's a really slick Femu with very solid outside footwork, distance management, and composure. He's weaker than Pan Payak and Q Payak in the clinch, though, and still has to get a bit better about dealing with aggressive clinch fighters. In his last fight, I think it was against Pet Ban Rai, who's a solid uh, clinch and knee fighter. He started out doing well at range, but ended up getting overwhelmed by the pressure and knees in the clinch. But he looked great against Captain Team here, who's another kicker who's with a similar style to him, but not as slick. He picked Captain Team apart on the outside here with footwork, distance management, and his open side body kick. He had a really nice, quick, flicking uh, rear leg kick to the body. He paired it really nicely uh, with a, a light defensive teep to disturb counters and transition into a floating block off the kick. So he would uh, throw that like really quick, light flicking kick to the body and then touch the leg down and immediately throw it a little defensive teep. So when the kick landed and Captain Team tried to step in to counter, he'd be met with that little teep that just, it wasn't like a hard pushing teep. It just kept Captain Team in place and prevented him from following for the counter. And Song Payak also had a nice floating block off his kick. So he would kick the body and then without touching his leg back down to the ground, he would keep it in the air and point it out to, to block Captain Team's return kicks. And once he'd established that little defensive teep off his body kick, he could show it just to make Captain Team hesitate without actually throwing it. He'd kick the body and then lift his leg up like he was going to teep. And Captain Team uh, would stay still and not move forward. And then he could skip out the side. He would also raise his leg like he was going to teep and then skip into a quick body kick. Song Payak also used the clinch nicely to control distance and snuff out Captain Team's counters. He would kick the body and then step his rear foot forward right off the kick and slide into an underhook and then hold for a separation. Kind of like that Floyd Mayweather thing where he'd throw a really long right hand and then duck into the clinch and hold for a ref separation. It lets you get your quick scoring blow off and then you eat up all the space before your opponent can counter. Song Payak also showed off a really nice side teep. He didn't throw it too often, but a couple times he caught Captain Team with that really strong uh, side teep while he was on one leg, while he was marching forward or trying to check one of his kicks, and, and like blasted him off his feet and knocked him on his ass. After he'd done that once or twice, he started picking up the leg like he was about to teep, and when Captain Team went to check, he'd step into elbows. It was a solid, disciplined, controlling performance from Song Payak, who's one of the better prospects in Muay Thai right now. Um, now that he's kind of broken into the top 10 at 115 pounds, I'd be really interested in a fight between him and Nadaka Yoshinari, although it seems like they're determined to, to match make Nadaka, so he only has like one or two legit fights against top competition per year. He's scheduled to fight 35-year-old Jamhad Eminent Air next, I think, defending his 115-pound Raj Damnern title, which doesn't make any sense, as Jamhad used to be a great fighter, uh, but he hasn't fought or beat any top competition in years at this point. The last fight I want to talk about is Samingdam Chora Jalabun against Yad Tong Sorjor Tong Prajin. Samingdam was on one of the better runs in Muay Thai between 2020 and 2022. He had win a win streak with wins over Pet Rung Rung, Ranachai, and Yothin. Uh, Ranachai and Yothin, two of the better pound for pound fighters in the sport. But shortly after that, he lost a couple in a row including one to Sam A, who's very old and was making his return fight in Muay Thai. And after that, he went to one championship for, I think, three fights. He won all three of them, but he hasn't looked great since coming back to Stadium Muay Thai. This was his second fight back, and in both of his return fights, he got finished by elbows in the, the third round. In this one, Yad Tong is a, a really long, tall guy, and he struggled with Yad Tong's height and length. Yad Tong was working behind a stabbing teep and using it to juggle Sam and Gam off. Uh, and leading him into open side kicks and knees when he tried to rush in past the teep. In the third round, Samingdam started pushing in for the clinch aggressively, um, but a minute into the round or so, he missed a leaping lead hook and ate a huge upwards elbow that dropped him. And after he got dropped, he got more aggressive and just kind of repeated that sequence like three times, where he'd miss his lead hook and then run right into the elbow until he eventually got KO'd. It was a pretty puzzling fight from Samingdam, but at least it made for a good knockout. All right, that's all the fights I wanted to cover for today. Stay tuned for midweek. I'm going to release a listener questions podcast 
for premium subscribers to my Substack. You can find that on mixingmartialarts.com. Only $5 per month gets you access to a growing library of in-depth premium articles, early access to any video breakdowns I make, as well as exclusive premium podcast episodes. And I'll look to have the Listener Questions podcast out probably Wednesday or Thursday this week.